you're saying this is now under the control of an external agent, a doctor or a drug. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, there are severe case, severe cases of anxiety where that's necessary. But there's a lot of people who prematurely and um, inappropriately allow their natural emotional states to be medicalized. Now, my emotion, this, these emotional problems are something that I don't have control over. I need to take this medication. Right, that's right. And the trouble, is, the trouble is, the trouble is, then you're not learning skills of controlling. You're not learning the mental, the cognitive, and the physical skills of controlling the emotions. So you're not building up a repertoire of control skills that will then allow you to to deal with different situations and different sources of anxiety. <laughs> What is going on, everybody? Thank you so much for joining yours truly, Ryan Caligiuri, on this week's episode of Cut the Crap Podcast Nation, where every single week I'm bringing you a book. I'm reading it, condensing it down to its core golden nuggets. I'm bringing the author on the show to have a conversation about the golden nuggets. And I'm here with you every single week, just trying to save you a little bit of time and bring you some information that can spark real change in your life. All right, so this week, we have a doozy for you. Now, I... I this is one of these things where I've been thinking about so much, so much. I know that I originally started off Cut the Crap podcast with just talking about sales and marketing books. Then I evolved to talk a little bit more about self-help books. And the more that I think about it, the more my mind just gravitates to wanting to understand how the brain works, how the mind works, how we can build this thing called resiliency, mental toughness. And I'm just so fascinated by that. And especially in the context of sales and marketing. I truly believe that if you give a script to somebody, if they have a, a level of mental toughness, a higher level of, of resiliency, being able to deal with adversity, I feel like I can give somebody who's able to deal with more stress, give them a script, a crappy script, and they'll do something with it and get their leads, hit their goals. Then if I give somebody just a world-class script, a script that has worked time and time again, it's been tested, it's the best script in the world, I give it to them. If they don't have this thing called mental resilience, mental toughness, they're going to give up. They're not going to try. So what's the difference between two people, two professionals? It's how they deal with stress, how they deal with adversities, the stories they tell themselves about how their life is progressing. And I, I really truly look at that as the competitive advantage and the secret competitive advantage that we're not talking about today. So today on the show, we're talking to Ian Robertson. He comes from uh, Dublin, Ireland, and he's talking to us about his book, The Stress Test, How Pressure Can Make You Stronger and Sharper. We talk about a number of things in this podcast that are so important, things that maybe you don't think about, things that maybe you've never heard about before, or a lot of things that maybe are reminders to you that you've heard time and time again, but maybe now, maybe now, for some reason, it just sinks in and you decide to do something with it, right? We've been talking about this for so long, and on this episode, we talk about it even further. So you know what? Enough jibber-jabber. Let's get right into this one. It's a great episode. This is Ian Robertson's The Stress Test, How Pressure Can Make You Stronger and and sharper. I'll catch you back here at the end of the episode. Enjoy. Ian, how you doing, my friend? Hello, Ryan. How are you doing? I'm doing very well. Thank you so much for coming on the show today and for making time for myself and uh, for everybody out there in Cut the Crap Podcast Nation. It's a pleasure having you on. And we're talking about something today that is very important, this idea of understanding how pressure can make you stronger and sharper. And your book, The Stress Test, I think this is very timely. We've been talking a lot about this on Cut the Crap Podcast. We've been focusing a great deal on resiliency. So having you on talking about this, it's going to be a real good episode. But before we really get into it, why don't you tell us a little bit about who you are, what you do, and why you wrote the book in the first place. Okay, so I'm a, currently I'm a cognitive neuroscientist. I work on research on attention and brain plasticity. But uh, I started off my career as a clinical psychologist <clears throat> and... Uh, I moved into neuroscience and I kind of looked back and realized that I should have been able to do an awful lot better with the people I saw when I was a, a rookie clinical psychologist, knowing what I do now about the plasticity of the brain and how we tend to have a kind of rather fatalistic view of people's emotional uh, problems as if somehow they're caused by medical factors out of their control. And I realized that from the research that was coming out, and particularly in the 1980s, showing that even the adult human brain is very, very plastic, but 
it shouldn't be the case that problems of anxiety or depression or things like that should be so ingrained. Uh, you know, the, the idea that these are caused by, if you like, diseases rather than by reversible mm. parts of the functioning of the mind and, and the brain uh, suddenly you know, came to me and I thought, my goodness, uh, I have to look back at my clinical practice and see what what could we do now differently, knowing what we do and being more optimistic about brain plasticity. Yeah, we've really started to understand. I don't think we, we truly understand exactly what the brain truly is and the power that it has over us. And I think that we've been maybe digging deeper into it. And because of people like you who are doing more discovery into it, we're understanding just that a lot of these beliefs that we once had that were set in stone, they're not true. They're not true. And that there's a lot of things out there that maybe challenge some of the conceptions in terms of how we believe certain diseases and disorders of the mind uh, come into play. And your book really digs deep into that one. And I, I would really like to just kick this one off with golden nugget number one, which kind of breaks us right into the core of the book. So golden nugget number one, Ian, help us understand why some people are crushed by the problems that life throws at them, while others they seem to be toughened by them. What happens between those two people? Like, what, what, what are the differences there? Well, one of the differences is that what people attribute uh, their emotional response to. Some people, some people who see themselves as their emotions as being caused by something they've inherited, by something fixed in them, if they see themselves becoming very emotionally disturbed as a result of something tough happening to them, um, they can take that as evidence of, of something fundamental happening to them rather than as being a transitory state mm. that can be changed. So there's a, first of all, there's a kind of fatalism that uh, people can have a fixed, what's called a fixed mindset. In Carl Dweck's words, a fixed mindset as opposed to a change mindset, a kind of a belief that the, the, if they're having a bad emotional time, this is caused by processes out of their control rather than in their control. Mm. So a, a, sec, a second thing is uh, related to that is, is a fear of fear and uh, uh, being f depressed about depression where mm. you, 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 you run away from these symptoms of anxiety which are pervasive and unavoidable in life but you see them as a symptom of something rather than as a, a natural response to a tough situation. And if you, if you can reconceive of them as being form of energy, if you like, that you can harness to try and cope with the situation as a challenge, if you like, rather than as a threat, then if you can get that challenge mindset, you will actually manage to uh, use these this, this non-specific energy, which is what, you see, the, the, the symptoms of, of anxiety are almost identical to the bodily symptoms of excitement hmm. and of anger. So these emotions are all the same. In, in terms of their physiological manifestation, and they only become the different emotions by how we, the labels we put on them, how we think about them. So by rethinking these emotions, and um, rather than feeling threatened and, and uh, fearful and anxious, regard that as, my goodness, the, I'm really roused here, I'm going to deal with this, this is a challenge, uh, this is a kind of strange excitement. If you can really manage to relabel your emotions in that way, actually, you're able to harness them. So uh, people who have never experienced any adversity in their lives, when they hit the inevitable tough times that hit people when they hit the labor market or mm -hmm. as young adults, they end up being less emotionally resilient because they've never had that experience of learning that these uh, symptoms pass, mm -hmm. first of all, and secondly, are, are potentially controllable and they're part of life. They're not some symptom of a, a, a bigger disease that have to be avoided. Ah, so Cut the Crap Podcast Nation, if you're out there listening to us right now and you're sitting there and you have anxiety, you believe that maybe you're not as resilient as you should be. You get shaken too quickly by things and you're sitting here right now listening to us and you might be asking, well, Ian, Ryan, how exactly do I become a little bit more resilient? You know, Ian, you talk about this idea of, of people who maybe shy away from adversity or people who maybe haven't experienced a lot of adversity in their life. They might not be as mentally resilient as those who have faced a lot of adversity in life because that maybe they've been able to deal with it or maybe it's, it's completely crushed them. But what kind of techniques, what kind of approaches can you give to somebody who's listening right now who does face anxiety and they want to build mental resilience? How can they help themselves? Well... 
first of all, I, I don't want to pretend that I can offer uh, an easy uh, cure to someone who's suffering from chronic severe anxiety. Of course. Of course. That per- someone like that needs to see a, a professional person and, and not you know listen to me as if mm-hmm. I'm talking about the normal range of, of stress and anxiety and where, where, where people who are you know still not pleasant, but we're not talking about people with chronic lifelong anxiety. That's right. Um, and and one 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 thing there is to is to try and identify what it is is making you anxious because sometimes people don't actually pin down wh- what is it actually that I'm anxious about, mm-hmm. and then to define um, try try and reconceive of that situation which at the moment they're thinking of as a threat. So for instance, it might be a difficult relationship with a workmate or with a boss or with a partner mm-hmm. and um, there's maybe there's maybe anxiety about how to approach or how to deal with this um, and and you know you can wake up early in the morning and be very worried you know what am I going to say what's going to happen so if you if you can manage to to say well I'm going to set myself a challenge of actually speaking to this person mm-hmm. in in a way that where I don't get upset myself I don't. I, I behave calmly and professionally. Or, or I, 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 so my challenge in this interaction becomes to conduct myself well, and not necessarily to fix the whole situation or change that person's behaviour. Mm-hmm. So you you reframe what is the the goal, if you like, of of, of a particular situation. You define a goal for yourself mm-hmm. that involves you um, slightly stretching yourself in terms of how you conduct yourself, of how you behave. If you manage to do that and achieve that goal, that will give you a, a great surge of confidence mm-hmm. and will actually help gradually shape you into what we call the challenge mindset as opposed to the threat mindset. And when you're in a challenge mindset, you're much more likely to be able to remember past successes rather than past failures. And you'll also notice uh, positive signs in the world as opposed to negative ones. You're more likely to see us notice a smiling face hmm. rather than a disapproving face, for instance. So your whole your whole attention and memory system becomes biased to more positive things, and that in turn will lift your mood and your confidence more. So it's a question of setting small achievable goals for yourselves in the domain about which you're anxious that help uh, break through out of the threat mindset into the challenge mindset. I've been talking about this for quite a while now, this idea of setting goals. And I think that when we talk about setting goals, we naturally brush it off as people, right? Like Cut the Crap Podcast Nation, when somebody says set goals and the way to become successful is through setting goals, how many of you out there actually take the time out of your day to set goals? How many of you take time to figure out where it is I want to go? Whether it's career-wise, with family, with finances, with my emotions, with relationships, whatever it is, how many of you actually set goals? The funny thing is, though, as we're talking about golden nugget number one and why some people get crushed and why others seem to rise above and they become mentally tough, as we're talking, the one thing that always comes down to, it's this one word, control. You feel like you give control to other people when you feel anxious, when you feel worried. You're giving control to fear. You're giving control to the unknown. But when you, as you mentioned, as one of your pieces of advice here was set a goal for yourself and work towards that, you know, uh, your goal is to have, um, you know, a a good conversation with this person or to stay under control um, uh, or keep your emotions under control. All of this comes down to you being able to control the situation. Now, when things get out of control and things happen to you, What can you control from that? Well, you can control what? Your response to that. And so as I keep thinking about this, is is control a big piece to how people essentially either get crushed by things or how they respond to become resilient? Is control really something that's that's important that you found through your studies, through your research? It's absolutely central. It's absolutely central. Um, Because uh, control... uh, if you believe you have control, then actions follow mm. from that. If, and actions, an action that you take is essentially a goal, a planned action, as long as it's planned and not impulsive. That's right. So, and so, uh, I, and with control comes predictability. Mm-hmm. Um, 
And if you can reduce unpredictability and increase the sense of control, <clears throat> that will inevitably decrease anxiety. That's right. And lift mood. Um, uh, so, yeah, control, uh, feeling out of control is, is one of the greatest sources of anxiety mm. that, in, in the world. And uh, it's for people to, and that's one of the problems of medicalizing emotional states. Because if you say my anxiety is caused by a genetic or a medical condition, you're you're giving up control. You're saying this is now under the control of an external agent, a doctor or a drug. Uh, and of course, there are severe case severe cases of anxiety where that's necessary. But there's a lot of people who prematurely and um, inappropriately allow their natural emotional states to be medicalized. And once you do that, that creates what's called, what Carl Dweck would call an entity or a fixed theory of your emotions, mm. which says, ah, my emotion, this, these emotional problems are something that I don't have control over. I need to take this medication. Right, that's right. And the trouble, is, the trouble is, the trouble is then you're not learning skills of controlling. You're not learning the mental, the cognitive and the physical skills of controlling the emotions. So you're not building up a repertoire of control skills that will then allow you to to deal with different situations and different sources of anxiety right. and you're if you if you like so that that's the great that's the great unspoken downside of medicalizing normal emotions mm, very good it's uh, i find it very interesting in that we try to seek comfort we seek comfort all the time and yet we we shy away from adversity. We shy away from the challenges, the problems of life. And yet, the more that you know, I speak to people like you, the more I read, the more I experience, the more conferences I go to, the more I understand that adversity is just a part of life and that it builds resiliency. But it all comes down to how you look at the challenges of life. You can either look at challenges as a victim and say, you know, why does this always happen to me? And then again, it comes down to control. You're not a control. But as Cut the Crap Podcast Nation, you know that I have a philosophy and I've shared this m time and time again, right? Um, two of them. This is not a setback. It's a set up. So when something bad happens, what's the setup? What's what's the good thing that I can take from all this negative? And the other one, life doesn't happen to me. It happens for me. Again, I'm not a victim. I'm taking control of the situation. This problem, this challenge, this adversity is here for a reason. There's something for me to take from it. There's something for me to learn from this. What is it? And again, that puts control back on you. So we've talked about this, but Ian's really put into a really nice way of, of framing this and shaping this um, to help us understand how we can become stronger, how we can become sharper. I truly love that. So let's go to golden nugget number two. And in golden nugget number two, we talk about thoughts and emotions and how they turn genes on and off, which actually physically reshapes the brain. And then the physical changes that happen in our brain, they then mold our thoughts and our emotions. That's a new thought for me. And I think for a lot of you out there in Cut the Crap Podcast Nation. So Ian, talk to us about this process and, and maybe how we can better control it as well. <clears throat> well, yeah, we often, in our current um, uh, medicalized world, we tend to think about how the chemistry of our brains and bodies influences how we feel and think. But actually, what's less understood as it goes the other direction as well what, what we what we think and how we feel mm. what we do with our minds actually shapes not only the our uh, emotions but it also shapes the uh, the physical structure of your brain right down to the, the switching on and off of genes to the, the, which is how our, our whole phys bodily physiology operates so that's why our our mental system is intimately linked to our immune system, for mm -hmm. instance, um, and that we, uh, how, how we approach the world, our, our psychological makeup has profound effects on the uh, our brain structure and function. So, you know, for instance, people who uh, who feel chronically out of control of their lives. Um, and as a result, feel a little bit depressed. I'm not talking about people with clinical depression here. Mm -hmm. I'm just talking about run-of-the-mill people. Right. They're, <clears throat> the hippocampus region of their brain, which is a critical memory region of the brain, is actually smaller um, than people who have a sense of control. Uh, so while that's correlation and not cause, there are, good, there are very good mechanisms that we understand that 
the chronic stress that happens as a result of feeling out of control or feeling that things happen to you actually increases um, certain neurotransmitters in the, in the brain and body, including uh, high amounts of one called glutamate and also cortisol. Um, and these in big, in too big and too sustained quantities actually can temporarily, fortunately, to shrink the critical memory center of the brain, the hippocampus. Mm. And um, that, that, of course, then reduces your memory capacity, which actually makes you feel a bit even more out of control. So it becomes a vicious cycle. So that's just one example of how, um, you know, we the, the profound effects of our mental state on our physiology of our, our bodies and our brains. And it's, it's really scary because if we're not aware of this, this is shaping our brain, essentially shaping our future in terms of who we become. So the importance of, of having this self-awareness, what kind of advice can you give to somebody out there who maybe they, they've, they've gotten themselves into this pattern of thinking, this pattern of thinking, how do they break that pattern? Because I, I feel like it's incredibly difficult to break that pattern, especially if they're, you know, 30, 40 years old, 50, 60 years old. How do you break that pattern to help maybe start to change, you know, the biochemistry of your brain to help change how you feel? Is it possible? Is there a certain point of no return? What have you found? Well, let me first of all say that too too much adversity is as bad as too little adversity. And there's a sweet spot in the middle of an optimal amount of adversity, which, if people embrace it properly, can actually result in benefits to them. And, and because they learn habits of control, they um, are able to uh, use these habits, these mental habits, to deal with other situations more effectively. Um, so that, that's you know, about, if you like, about uh, generally uh, about uh, adversity. But in terms of what you do practically, the crit critical thing is, is, is doing stuff, is behavior, which mm -hmm. goes back to the goal setting, that um, actually, you know, we think, oh, I feel this way, therefore I behave in this way, but mm -hmm. actually it goes the other way around as well. Hmm. We can change our feelings and thoughts by the way we behave. So and we can behave in ways that we may not necessarily feel like they don't feel comfortable. So, for instance, if we are very anxious um, about a particular situation, if we just set ourselves a small goal that takes us slightly beyond our comfort zone, uh, um, it's not too easy and not too hard because there's a sweet spot for goals as well. Hmm. Then we will get a small boost of actually a natural neurotransmitter the increase of dopamine activity hmm. as part of the reward network, and that's a natural little mini dose of a natural antidepressant right. and that will build confidence and, 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 and lift our mood and make it more likely we'll be able to achieve another goal. So the critical thing is in, in, in breaking out of these vicious cycles is actually um, through behavior, through what we do, hmm. do stuff. Um, and, and people often think, oh, I can't do stuff. One of the great things about anxiety is, um, and there's good evidence for this in general, Chronically anxious people or, or nervous people who are nervous throughout their lives do less stuff. Hmm. So they they call up their friends and say, "Oh, I'm not coming out tonight because you know they cancel on people mm -hmm. because they they believe that they're they're going to um, uh, they, they imagine terrible things happening. Hmm. They imagine I'll make a fool of myself. Oh, it's going to be a terrible night. So they call off and they end up doing less things. If you do less things, you're less likely to meet someone or encounter something or think something. That's going to be rewarding for you, and so you cut, you reduce the number of possibilities of getting natural um, hmm. experiences that actually switch on the natural antidepressant system of the brain. Hmm. So, so I'd say doing stuff is a critical Interesting. part. Doing stuff in a planned way, not just doing anything, not doing stuff impulsively, but setting small goals for yourself that take you beyond your comfort zone. Now, this is a big thought, but I'm thinking about just human nature our existence right we've been around for thousands and thousands and thousands of years so when you say you know we have to do stuff is that because inside our genes we're programmed to you know thousands and thousands of years ago to hunt to find food to find shelter uh, you know all of these things that are innate within our genes within our bodies and now because we have such comfort around us we don't have to do anything i don't have to hunt for food i don't do anything is that a part of it as well i think that's part of it i think um I think for sure, if, if you if you are just preoccupied with survival, if you're having to tend your vegetable patch, if you're having to go out and 
pick your food, if you're having to engage, and if there is all these goals presented to you purely to survive, mm. that <laughs> has a natural <laughs> form. That's right. Yeah, and just, you know, find it, finding that clump of berries in the bush mm -hmm. will give you as big a hit as any drug. That's true. It, you know, it will give you that sense of a goal <laughs> achieved. Wow, I've got the food for the next few hours. So I think you're right. I think the fact that automation and technology and, and civilization has taken a lot of these necessary actions off of our agendas means that we have to engage in the rather, the rather unusual and rather kind of you know, it doesn't come naturally to us to sit down and say, well, what's my goal for the next hour? Mm -hmm. You know, and a lot of people, a lot of people don't do that. And as a result, a lot of people can end up, you know, watching television all day, couch potatoes, mm -hmm. you know, or just, you know, wandering about in a purposeless way, feeling low mood. Mm -hmm. Of course, when your mood goes down, you do less. That's right. and, and so it's a vicious cycle. So this, this business of it sounds so trite and simple, setting goals for yourself, but actually it's a critical way of starting to feel in control, and it it, it actually is, is is part of the natural way we're supposed to be functioning. We're supposed to be <laughs> living to find a mate, to 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 get food, to to protect ourselves, to scout out for a, a, a you know new new horizons. So so that that's it's it's not rocket science, you know, but we don't a lot of people don't do it. That's right. And again, it's just awareness of it. A lot of us don't think about it that way. We think that things are far more complicated and I need this or I need this to be happy or this needs to happen. And it becomes yeah. so complex and we make it harder on ourselves yeah. to be happy than it truly is. Yeah, that's right. So now for golden nugget number three, I want to talk about this thing that you mentioned in the book called self-repraisal. What is that and why is it important for us to practice that? You know, for instance, look, I, I'm uh, age mid 60s now and i am uh n n not hunting down I I'm, I'm still at university but i'm not i don't have a big lab of 20 people that i'm trying to um the, the competitiveness of getting research grants and uh, so i'm doing research but i'm doing it in a much more low-key way so i'm having to reappraise if you like my place in the world uh, and everyone, as you as you as we de develop through life, we're constantly having to recalibrate who we are and what our goals are and what we're you know what the basis of our self evaluation is and what gives us pleasure and what gives us satisfaction. Mm. And 20 years ago, you know, I was gung ho, you know, competing and presenting conferences, trying to get into the best journals. Now I, st I do that to some extent still, but not not with the same kind of. It's not central to my aspirations the way it was before so i've had to reappraise myself and and think well actually i mean there's something really enjoyable but about, about being somewhat out of that rat race of being able to enjoy um more control over your time doing things you enjoy uh you know not not um uh, competing 100 percent and so it's but that requires you to reappraise yourself to 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 say well look uh, I'm 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 not trying to compete with the top people in the field to the same extent. I'm not publishing as much. I'm not getting the big research grants that we I you know as much as I was. Mm -hmm. Um and so that so that kind of all throughout life there are so so similarly, you know, if you know, you if you identify yourself as a parent and your children and you know, you have all these goals, if you're bringing up children, these goals present themselves to you. You know, your your time is full. You don't have to be thinking about what am I going to do this Saturday. It's all laid out for you. <laughs> uh, and um, uh, but suddenly your children leave home, and suddenly you're having to, you know, you you've maybe identified as that's been part of who you are as being a you know a busy parent. And suddenly you're no longer a busy. You're still a parent, but you're no longer a busy <laughs> parent. How do you how do you particularly if that's been your job? Um, how do you how do you reappraise yourself? How do you how do you um, uh, you conceive of this uh, situation in a way that allows you to still feel satisfied and, and motivated and, and positive. So th this is this is um, something which, you know, when we're faced with a challenging, a stressful situation, maybe someone at work really giving us a very tough time, maybe a supervisor, and you know, we can we can do one of two things. We can we can try and with one of three things actually we can try and change the situation so we can try and say uh, speak to, to the 
the boss's boss or, mm -hmm. or try and organize in some way to change the behavior of that person. Mm -hmm. That's one, one way. Second thing we can do is we can, we can leave. You know, we mm -hmm. can say, right, I'm out of here. I'm not, I don't need to stay here. But maybe you do need to stay there for various reasons. And the third way is to reappraise. And you can reappraise a situation or you can reappraise yourself. Um, and you can reappraise a situation by saying, well, look, you know, there, there's, the world is full of jerks and it's a fact of life that unfortunately a number of jerks get into powerful positions. Uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to approach this particular jerk's behavior with a, a quiet, wry cynicism mm -hmm. and just try and keep control within my small domain and not let this person get under my skin. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm not going to get, allow myself to get angry and humiliated by this person's behavior, uh, I'm going to reappraise it as a kind of disorder, uh, you know, a, a fact of life that I have to live with. That would be an example of reappraising sure. the situation. An example of reappraising uh, you know, yourself would be, um, you know, if you're feeling very angry, would be to say, ah, you know, what, what is the what is what is it that's making me angry here? Why 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 is it the way this person behaves to me? What is it? Um, you know, let me let me just think about this, and and maybe who knows, maybe it'll take you back to some early mm. humiliation you had as a school child, or or something like that, or some is striking some kind of nerve in you, and so you're kind of you're thinking, oh, this is interesting. I, I'm interested in my response to this person who's really getting on my nerves and really making me feel bad, and you become a kind of psychologist for yourself, and and and, and turn the situation mm. into. Wow, how interesting how I'm responding to this. Uh, and that's, if you like, reappraising the self and mm -hmm. just saying, well, here is, there, is actually, is there a lesson here? Is there something I can learn from from how I'm responding to this situation? And, and uh, can, can I, and again, can I set myself the challenge of um, uh, for myself of learning to cope with this mm -hmm. without becoming emotionally overwrought, for mm -hmm. instance? There's so many different things to think about, and you've given us a number of things to think about, especially in this golden nugget here. But I got to believe that one of the challenges as to why we don't do this so often is that we are so distracted by by our, our televisions, our phones, our laptops, and, and everything that's around us. We're so distracted at all points in time. A minute that we have, just any, any time where we have some quiet, what do we do? We go reaching for our phones. When in actuality, maybe sometimes you just have to take a walk in nature, be alone with your own thoughts, and allow you to process the day, allow you to think about things in a little bit more detail. Go inside of your own head, understand what, what makes you tick, understand how to take a certain situation and mold it so that it supports you. But we don't do that because we're always so distracted. So again, this is we, we've talked about this before, everyone. Everyone out there listening, Cut the Crap Podcast Nation, we've talked about this before in terms of you know shutting off the notifications, shutting off the technology, and allowing you to be alone with your mind sometimes so you can think about things. And as you're going through all this, Ian, that was just the thing that I kept thinking about is that we just don't have enough time today. Sorry, we do have time. We're not making time to give uh, to, to our mind and to allow ourselves to process these thoughts, to make sense of them. And uh, I think that's the challenge that I put out there for all of you listening right now is allow yourself some time for reappraisal because, or for self reappraisal, because it's, it's one of those important things that we don't focus enough on that I think can make a, a tremendous impact in your life. Let's go to golden nugget number four. One of the secrets of getting through the day without having too many hitches, you say, is to be able to stop routines at the right time and not get carried along under the control of the automatic pilot parts of the brain. So talk to us about the danger of the automatic pilot and how we can avoid it. <clears throat> yeah, so most of our behavior is not under our conscious deliberate control. Most of our behavior is habit uh, controlled by parts of the brain to which we don't have conscious access. And we wouldn't be able to function if that uh, didn't happen. Um, but we can, uh, these habits can become a bit over dominant so that we don't leave space for ourselves to reflect on what actually we want to be doing at any particular time. And this we come. This does come back to to goals um, again, mm -hmm. but you know, for for example, I mean, you were mentioning technologies. Um, 
you know, we get into the habits of, as you say, of always checking our mm-hmm. news feeds, checking social media, checking our email, uh, filling it, filling our time. These these are these are habits in automatic pilot. They're not just physical habits; they're mental habits. And so, uh, what that does is it, it makes it harder for us to take stock periodically to say what what do I really want to be doing? What should I be doing mm-hmm. here? And that's where breaking up your your day or your week into knowing what it is you are doing at this moment and why. Mm. Just being aware of this. So, you know, I'm I'm going to tidy my desk. You know, my desk is a mess here. So I'm just going to enjoy tidying my desk. Mm -hmm. I'm going to spend the next half hour tidying my desk and that's all that's going to be in my mind is tidying my desk and i'm going to get pleasure and discovering things and i'm not going to get sidetracked into answering the emails when the mm-hmm. computer bleeps because i'm going to switch off the computer and then at the end of that goal that tiny little goal that little mini goal i just take three minutes and i just do nothing i just sit and enjoy the feeling of having a tidy desk. Hmm. So I just take that. So these these periods of doing nothing where you let parts of the brain have free reign that are otherwise inhibited where they're always doing stuff. If you just take if you set if you set chunks of you know feasible goals that are meaningful and that stretch you a little bit, uh, but then you break up these goals a little five or three to five minutes of just sitting, doing nothing. Hmm. The evidence is, uh, for instance, if your goals are to do with reading something or writing something, if you take that five minutes at the end of that 30 minutes or the end of that 50 minutes, you will remember that stuff better Hmm. than if you immediately pick up your phone and start reading the news feed or playing a game or something. Why? Because when you, the, all of these activities require you to use attentional networks in the brain that automatically inhibit or switch off the deep default mode network in the middle of the brain, which is a kind of uh, internal attention system where you 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 re, re, re uh, package old memories, you think, you reminisce, you you think, you daydream. Uh, when, when we're in always doing stuff mode, we, 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 we inhibit that activity. Mm-hmm. And that activity, if you like, is our unconscious working away that can come up with ideas. Oh, God, I never thought I could do that. Or, oh, supposing I do that, supposing I take the afternoon off, or supposing I go, the, go there tonight. If you're always in the automatic pilot, these ideas of novel goals that you might uh, take up uh, get inhibited. And so it's very that that's why the the doing nothing periods of doing nothing is actually very sits very nicely with the you know setting goals. Very interesting. So it's a matter of is it a matter of going through our day like for for example. Uh, I'm kind of on autopilot, I guess, but maybe not so much. Like I knew that I was going to wake up today. I knew that I was going to work out. I knew that we had this interview first thing in the morning for myself in the late evening for yourself. And I knew that I had this, 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 this interview, you know, but maybe was I on autopilot? I guess so, because I knew that I had this coming up, but instead are you saying that I need to be more purposeful in my actions and say, okay, for the next hour, I'm going to dedicate my time to working with Ian. And in that hour, my goal is to get the best interview possible for Cut the Crap Podcast Nation, to ask the best questions, to have the best conversation. And then as soon as I finish it, just reflect on on, on that task. Is that what you're saying? Is it to become more purposeful in our actions? Yes, absolutely. And to enjoy it Mm. and to enjoy the moment and not to be, while you're doing it, glancing over your schedule to say, what am I doing next? Ah. Or you know, what else should we be doing? That 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 kind of that kind of divided attention is hugely sapping of energy and effort and cognitive resources. Every time we sw- because we cannot dual task, we can only do one thing at a time, mm-hmm. unless it's highly automatic. Mm-hmm. Uh, but for, in terms of conscious activities, we can only do one thing at a time. And but if we have the illusion of multitasking of keeping a number of balls in the air at the same time, that is an enormous cognitive cost because it requires multiple switching 
between tasks. We, 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 can, we don't do one thing at a time, but what we can do is switch rapidly, cycle rapidly between tasks, between goals. But that is a huge cognitive cost. Every switch costs, that's right. costs mental resources. So that's why it's very good to just, okay, this is what I'm doing. I'm doing this interview for this period. I'm going to enjoy it and be mindfully engaged in it. At the end of this, I'll sit down and I'll just take a deep breath and I'll just do nothing for three minutes and I'll enjoy the feeling of a task accomplished. Mm, I love that. And again, it goes back to our last point, talking about technology and how we're constantly distracted. Where, you know, how many of you out there are sitting down with with your spouse, your kids, and you know, you're having a conversation with them, but at the same time, your attention is taken away by what's on TV, and attention is being taken away by what's on your phone right now, or or what have you. And now your attention is split, and you have this switching that happens. And switching in life, as as in business, is very inefficient, and you don't truly get your best product out because of all this switching because of all the distraction that happens so by being purposeful and by giving something or someone your entire attention it'll allow you to become a lot better as a person it'll allow you to connect better to communicate better and to get a better result and i think at the very end of it be a little bit more proud of yourself to say wow i actually accomplished something because i think now it's such a challenge to actually give such attention that that mini goal could be a big win and you might get a little shot of dopamine just because you were able to shut everything off and shut off all the distractions so that's such a great takeaway ian i truly love that that is the stress test How Pressure Can Make You Stronger and Sharper by Ian Robertson. Ian, I'm telling you, this is such an important topic, and it was a true pleasure having you on the show to talk to all of us about that and give us a number of great golden nuggets to take away and a lot of things to practice after they listen, after uh, we listen to this interview. But uh, this is a, a great honor having you on the show. Uh, if anyone wants to get in contact with you or if they want to reach out and learn a little bit more about what you're doing, how can they do that? Uh, on my website, ianrobertson.org. Ian, I-A-N, Robertson, I-A-N-R-O-B-E-R-T-S-O-N, dot org. My website there. Happy to hear from you. Contact me there. Wonderful. Excellent. Well, Ian, again, thank you so much for making time for myself and for everyone out there on Cut the Crap Podcast Nation. It was a true pleasure. Good talking to you. Bye-bye. Right, there we have it. That's the stress test. How pressure can make you stronger and sharper by Ian Robertson. I told you at the beginning this was going to be a good episode. If you don't think this is a good episode, I think you're crazy. I think you're out of your mind, personally. I love this episode because there's such strong takeaways that you need to take. You need to take this and put into practice for yourself because if you're not, you're missing out. And if you're not, then hopefully, hopefully you already knew this and it's just regurgitation of old information. And I really hope that's the case if you didn't take anything from this. But again, we don't talk about this stuff that often. So if you listen to this podcast and at the very end of it, you said, ah, there's nothing really here for me. I'm going to beg you to reconsider that because there's so many good things from this episode that I believe that if you just put one of them into practice for yourself, will make you a better human being, make you a better, stronger, more resilient, more mentally tough individual. So if you liked this episode, then please go online. Do me a favor. Do Ryan a favor. I like talking to myself in the third person. Rate and review the show and send me that screen capture, that rating, that review to podcast at ryancalajuri.com and I'll make sure you get entered in the draw every quarter for a prize. And of course, this quarter's prize, I'm giving away a $500 gift certificate to Amazon. So get your entries in. Also, don't forget to connect with me on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Connect with me. See what I'm talking about throughout the week and just gives you another opportunity to connect with me. All right, my friends, that is a wrap for today. Again, thank you so much to all of you for tuning in. This episode is really important to me. So you know what? Actually, before I let you go, do me a quick favor and send this out to your friends, to your family members, to your colleagues, coworkers, peers through social media. Getting this information out to them could be incredibly important to the development of them as professionals, as individuals. And who knows? It might come at a time where they just needed to understand how to deal with stress better and maybe something that will just change their frame of mind a little bit. And this could be it. So please do me a favor, send this one out there. All these podcasts, you know, they're all good, but there's certain ones that really strike a chord with me and this one's one of them. So please do me a favor, get the good word out there and I would truly appreciate it. But in any case, my friends, that's a wrap for today. So I will catch you back here next week when I have a brand new book, brand new golden nuggets, an interview with an author. And of course, you know what I'm doing here every single week. I'm just trying to save you a little bit of time and bring you some information that can spark real change in your life. Fantastic, inspired week, everybody. Love you all.
I don't know how to get people out of depression. I'm just trying to change people's perspective. Gratitude is my fuel. I think most people burn out because they're looking for money. I think people are depressed when they don't have things into context. They don't realize how lucky they have it. And two, they don't feel in control. When the game itself and the process and gratitude is the mix of your gasoline, you'll run forever. I've already won. D-Rock, this game's vigged. I already won. I figured myself out. I know what makes me happy. Nothing in the world makes me happier. Everybody is the happiest when they get to do what they want to be doing. When you get to do what you want to do, you've won. I think the problem is that people get to a place where they don't want to go backwards because they get fancy, right? They get accustomed to a certain lifestyle. They want certain things. When it's about getting a watch or buying a new home or getting a new pair of Yeezys, you're finished. And I will tell you the number one thing that scares the fuck out of me. (laughs) Nice watches and Ferraris. And so I see a lot of people looking for quick highs, that is just not sustainable. Glass half empty is a terrible way to live life. This is full as fuck for me. I know exactly what to do with what's in there. I know exactly what the fuck to do with this and other people don't know what to do with a full fucking container. Entitlement, you're fucking entitled. If you ever in your life bought a $5 fucking coffee from Starbucks, you are fucking soft. Globally, in the 7.7 billion people, you're fucking fancy, you're soft. There's 50 million people that came from dick shit and fucking made it. So what the fuck's your excuse? Both my parents were crackheads, and? Like, uh, I lost my job, and? My husband's beating me, and? I'm not fucking saying these are small things, these are the hardest things in life. Here's my question, life's about alternatives. What the fuck are you gonna do about it? Nobody has anything to complain about. Unless you're the worst human on earth. In the world rankings of humans, you're 7.7 billion. You live in a cage and you're a slave somewhere where nobody's looking. Because that's who that person is. Unless you're that person, stop complaining. My stuff is for the complainers who don't realize they have time to fix it. They just have to change their behavior. You can't complain about your weight if you didn't put in the work. You may be genetically deep disposition to not have as great of a body or be as healthy and that's just life and that's real. But I wasn't allowed to complain about my health at 37. I wasn't doing the right things. Or you can sit at home, play fucking 2K and blame the world for your shortcomings. Period. They don't wanna do that. Brother, people don't wanna work. You know why? It's easier to complain. Mentality. The religion, baby. Like you, like, but if you don't complain, then you've, then you've won. You can do it any way you want. Make a dollar a year, make it all the dollars in a year. You've won, it's not about that. Spend every minute with your kids, spend no minutes with your kids. If you're happy and you don't complain, you've won.